freedom is a pure idea. It occurs spontaneously and without instruction. See what the Empire has done to your lives, your families, and your freedom? Good people will fight if we leave them. The rebellion is spreading. Now we take the war to them. The Republic will be reorganized. The systems either change or die. You give way to an enemy this evil with this much power, and you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission. I don't wake up when there is one way of fighting me. Stop it. The Empire! Let's call it war. Remember this. Try. Hey, Ellie. Hi, Sophie. Why did episodes four, five, and six come out before one, two, and three? Because seven, eight, nine. No, it's because in charge of scheduling, Yoda was. You stole that, you dirty fucking whore. I stole that from my mom. You're listening to the Daughters of Ferrix podcast, the only podcast exploring the intersection of politics, queerness, and Star Wars that involves no chicanery of any sort. I'm your host, Sophia Dunstan. My no chicanery t-shirt is raising a lot of questions <laughs> answered by my t-shirt. I am Eleanor, last name. Okay, now that I've produced the best episode intro of all time, i Yeah, I'm... it's kind of fucked up that you're doing the intro here. It's going to be really weird and uneven now. Mm-hmm. Now you have to introduce the next six episodes to make it No, we make don't. It square. This is my episode. Eleanor, what is a Nazi? A Nazi is anyone that I disagree with. I'm not joking, by the way. All of the people I disagree with turn out to be Nazis. <laughs> Kind of interesting how that works out. It's almost like I'm oh, ontologically you're an perfect. fascist or something? <laughs> Your politics is defined primarily by opposition to fascism? How interesting. Listen, I will generally say that it's a mistake to have a political stance that is largely defined in opposition to something. However, looking at my own politics, moving on. Um, <laughs> so a Nazi is a bad, right? Imagine if, if world history wanted to make for us a boogeyman that we could <laughs> reference at every fucking possible instance. <laughs> I think we've we've mentioned really the Empire being Nazis in most of the episodes so far. It's really just, like, difficult to produce a regime evil than the Nazis. They were possibly the most destructive regime in the history of mankind. Nazi-controlled military and paramilitary forces, like the Stukstaffel, directly killed as many as 30 million people and contributed to the untimely deaths of somewhere between 10 and 15 million more. Ah. Uh, that's a lot of dead people. That's a lot of dead people. These included over 6 million Jewish people, which amounts to a staggering 70 percent of all Jews living in Europe at the time, uh, and more than 25 million Soviet citizens, both military and civilian. Wait, how many? 25 million. 25? Yeah, the, but... The population the, of the Soviet <laughs> Union at the time was 200 million, which means that this is 12 to 13 percent. That's fine. You can just get some more from the <laughs> Soviet store. Okay. Bad, huh? Bad. They perpetuated crimes against humanity at a rate almost too great to imagine during their 10 years in power, some of which you are almost certainly aware of already. In short, there's a reason why they've become the stereotypical bad guys in Western media for the last 80 years. Also because they looked dumb. They had good uniforms for evil guys. They didn't have it. Fuck, they were fucking designed by fucking Hugo Boss. Of course they were good. They were good, like, bad guy uniforms. There is a real trend in the fashion industry of having people become successful designers and also extremely sympathetic with the Nazi party. Coco Chanel. Was yeah, a Coco Nazi. was a collaborator. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So, the so in- now that we've run down all the horrible crimes against humanity of the Nazis, let's talk about their kleptomania, which is clearly a much larger problem. The impetus for this episode is just let's use some Star Wars stuff as an excuse to talk about some wild ass Nazi shit. And the way that we're going to do that is by talking about Imperial Beskar. The story of Imperial Beskar is largely the story of an occupied Mandalore. Sophie, do you know what Mandalore is? It's where that guy with the child Yoda is from. Uh, not actually, but sure. The child Yoda. <laughs> Mandalore is the Mandalorian homeworld, so it's the center of the Mandalorian government. Mandalore is a system. There are lots of different Mandalorian worlds, and where different Mandalorians come from is disparate and wide-reaching. And what constitutes a Mandalorian is a matter of some debate, which is why Din is is not Din is not from Mandalore. He's a religious Mandalorian, not an ethnic Mandalorian. Precisely. Din is a convert. Din is a foundling. Can you be called a convert if you were taken in at that age? That's a great question. Or an indoctrinated victim. 
Isn't everyone in religion an indoctrinated victim? <laughs> yes, this is so true. I don't, okay, if we're talking about like an adult conversion process, I don't think that's something that we know about with certainty in canon. You can make some comparisons and I would have to check some stuff in Legends. Certainly, I mean, within the, this is not what this is about. Um, <laughs> Mandalore kind of went through hell before and during the Clone Wars. There's a civil war that destroys the planet's ecosystem, turns the whole thing to a fucking like desert. Everyone has to live inside these city domes. There's a coup backed by Maul and like this very real organized criminal element. A double coup and a siege <laughs> backed by the Republic. Cool. At the end of the Clone Wars, Mandalore is a world that is nominally independent from the rule of the up and coming Galactic Empire. But the regent at the time, which is Bo-Katan Kree's sister of the previous Duchess, it's a whole thing. She's put in place by that Republic intervention, by the siege. And I guess she was not as receptive to imperial rule as they wanted. Yeah, because she's a theocrat, not a fascist. Pretty much. The Empire put Mandalore under another siege. They prop up this more imperialist, loyal figurehead, Gar Saxon. Gar Saxon from the Mandalorian clan Saxon. Former lackey of Maul's, like, Mandalorian gang. There's a couple of arcs of television and a comic about it. But I guess being, like, working for Maul for a while didn't really matter, because Saxon at, at one point becomes, like, a covert operative for Palpatine. And then they make him viceroy and governor of the Mandalore system. For a while, over a decade, imperial rule of Mandalore is the status quo. Lots of Mandalorians are raised loyal to the empire. There's an imperial academy built on Mandalore, likely as a means of both taking advantage of and neutralizing a culture that breeds proficient warriors and tacticians. Imperial rule over Mandalore does not last forever. Things devolve <laughs> further into another civil war. If you're counting along, that's two civil wars, two sieges, and and two coups. And then they glass it. We're getting there. Oh. The Mandalorian clan Wren grows to view Gar Saxon's fealty to the Empire as treasonous. Clan Wren's leader Ursa Wren kills Gar Saxon to save her lesbian daughter. Conflict. Save her from what? Uh, getting shot by Gar Saxon. For being lesbian or for a different reason? For a different reason. Okay. <laughs> She just is lesbian. <laughs> That's a side note. Gar Saxon is killed by Ursa Wren. Conflict breaks between these two clans. Various clans take their own positions across the war. The Empire appoints another Saxon as governor as a follow-up, who is, I believe, blown up in further insurgency, as led by Bo-Katan Kryze. She's back again. She's got a magic sword as a sign of her right to rule. Star Wars, baby. <laughs> it's really just like Arthurian bullshit. Yeah, it is. So this is an on going campaign that stretches on for like five or six years, this insurgence against the Galactic Empire on Mandalore, with the Empire largely backing an on-world Mandalorian contingent until the Empire decides to cut its losses. <laughs> so they determine, this has been going on for half a decade, they're like, Mandalore is ungovernable, so pff, it just shouldn't exist they anymore. It. They glass it. They lay the fucking planet to waste. Gunships, tie bombers, they target cities. They incinerate the planet's surface with fucking fusion bombs. So they there are nuke. nuclear bombs in Star Wars. There are nuclear bombs in Star Wars, in both oh, Legends and canon, yeah. And send droids across the wreckage to pick off survivors. In an event that later Mandalorians called the Night of a Thousand Tears, they nuke Mandalore. For those keeping track, that is two planet-destroying conflicts. But this one is significantly uh, worse. I feel like they got that name from Tolkien. The Night of a Thousand Tears? Because mm -hmm. there's you a battle of, of unnumbered tears. You're thinking of the Near Knife Arnoidia. Yes, I am. Yes. And I'm also thinking of the Night of the Long Knives and Crystal Schnock. Or crystal, I, I can't do German. Kristallnacht. There yes, I think there's a small there's likelihood of that taken from the Near Knife. The Night of a Thousand Tears is from The Mandalorian, but it is possible that that is a Dave Filoni insertion, and there are a fair number of Lord of the Rings references throughout Rebels and Ahsoka, so it's possible. Anyway, <laughs> Mandalorian Purge. Uh, not just the Mandalorians, but the women Delorians and the children Delorians, too. <laughs> and aside from my own vanity, we don't know the precise year uh, that the Purge of Mandalore takes place. It's supposedly at the end of the war, but I also don't know if I see an empire as like broken and fucked up as the one after Endor capable of doing that to the Mandalorian people. Some people see it as an event that falls in line with the wider Operation Cinder, where the post-Palpatine Empire, they destroy a lot of worlds in similar fashion. For punsies. There are reasons, but they're bad reasons. I think any reason for destroying an entire world is generally a bad reason. Well, yeah, any reason for doing imperial 
imperial fascism is a bad reason. Interesting. But anyway, I don't really buy that that's part of Operation Cinder. I think it's something that happened not long before the Battle of Endor. That's not super important, but this is my new hill that I'm dying on until they actually flesh this out. Mandalore is a sector. It's got other worlds besides Mandalore. And the four million presumably killed were a far cry from like Alderaan's two billion. But it was still a majority of the Mandalorian people and a thoroughly genocidal action on the part of the Empire. It was a spiteful, extirpatory measure. All but few exceptions of clans Ren and Kree's were killed. The handful of Mandalorians who remained in the galaxy largely came from what factions and people existed off the homeworld, which also greatly changed the landscape of Mandalorian culture, as many of those coverts that exist off-world from Mandalore were either less connected to the Mandalorian way of life, or those shunned by the general populace for being more radical and orthodox in their religious practice. Also terrorist death cults, anyway. Problematic. Shout out to any Death Watch members listening. Shout out to any members of terrorist death cults. <laughs> hit me up. Please do not hit me up. In this genocide, many cultural artifacts of the Mandalorians were claimed by the Empire. The fancy sword, the dark saber, as a religious symbol, goes to an Imperial moth, but vast quantities of Beskar were taken as well. In the Mandalorian culture and religion, the armor is a second skin. It is central to their way of life, so that they can be the perfect little action figure men. In some more radical sects, the Mandalorian helmet wasn't to be removed around other living beings, right? And if you do, you get fucking excommunicated. <laughs> the helmet is the face of the proud Mandalorian warrior warrior that wears it. The armors that forge this equipment take on an almost priestly role in their communities. They carry this arcane knowledge of ironwork, and crafting the armor is described as an act of worship. That is worship of what? Badass. No idea. It's and super like, cool. There are like real world religious parallels to that. Yeah, well, I know sure. that there's this priest in Minnesota who like forges by hand all of the like Eucharistic chalices and stuff That's for churches sick. and stuff and says that that's part of his practice of Christianity. And I have a friend in Arizona who always bakes the bread for communion, which is like... That's cool. Like, this is like probably drawn from some other real life examples, but those are the ones I could think of off my head. Mandalorian armor can be made of a lot of different materials. Originally in canon, as it was in Legends, drawing from the, I think, Attack the Clones visual dictionary, Jango Fett's armor and Boba Fett's armor as a result was Durasteel. Uh, it has been retconned to be Beskar, because Beskar is the one that most of them are made out of. Beskar is an alloy. Uh, alloy in canon, not alloy in legends. It's an alloy, it's lightweight, it boasts, like, extreme durability. It's blaster-proof and lightsaber-proof. It's blaster-proof, it's lightsaber-proof. Which is not common. I uh, no, and, like, that's super fucking useful. Hundreds of years before A New Hope was the Mandalorian Jedi War, and you better fucking believe that that sets Beskar to be commonplace. It was already around before that, but I'm sure that usage in that war really fucking solidified it. Beskar lasts a tremendous amount of time without noticeable wear. Some Mandalorian Mandalorian armor is passed parent to child for hundreds and hundreds of years. Sabine Wren's armor is like 500 years old or something. To the Mandalorian people, Beskar is seen as the rightful property of their society by its very nature. So, after the Night of a Thousand Tears, the Empire takes this precious metal for themselves. Some of it pulled directly off of the fresh corpses of Mandalorian warriors, and they melt it down into ingots, marbled in color, stamped with the Imperial Cog, as a symbol of the regime that nearly erased the descendants of the Mandalorian people from the galaxy. We don't have record of the Empire using the Beskar that they stole, which is possibly because the metal requires like a degree of proficiency to use in the same way that Mandalorians do. Again, this sort of metalwork knowledge is kept as a sacred secret. Beskar is extremely valuable, but it's not like the Empire needed that wealth. Ultimately... Considering they own the galaxy. Yeah, right? but they, they took that Beskar and they, they kept it. They stored it. I think, I mean, in retrospect, it seems like the Beskar was kept and marked as Imperial out of vanity. Yeah, the glory of having conquered the unconquerable, the proud Mandalorian people, and having plundered their sacred heirlooms to add to the Imperial horde. Eventually, those Beskar ingots end up in the hands of certain Imperial warlords. Some try to use it, some try to use it to barter. Our favorite casually prejudiced bounty hunter, Din Djarin, uh, gets paid for a bounty pickup in Beskar by one of those guys. Racist against droids. Racist against droids, kind of racist against Ugnaughts. 
I love him. Religious he learns. Extremism. <sighs> yeah. Being raised in a pretty homogenous religious sect really does a number on a kid. Some Beskar does eventually make it back to its native culture as Mandalore is resettled, but much would undoubtedly end up lost to the winds of galactic trade, plunder, and misuse. Uh, that's it. That's the Mandalorians. Take it away, so Sophie. Take it away. The Nazis, right? As they were doing all of the same things that the Empire was doing on a somewhat smaller scale. Somewhat? Look, with how many people they killed, it is only a somewhat smaller scale. The Empire killed billions of people. The Empire did not kill anyone because it does not exist. In the fiction of Star Wars, whom <laughs> we are talking about, you are correct in that the Nazis killed more people than the Galactic Empire from Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. For research for this episode, I read a fantastic book by a wonderful gentleman named George Tabor. It's called Chasing Gold, The Incredible Story of How the Nazis Stole Europe's Bullion. Oh my god, Tabor, I love Love him in Young Jedi Adventures. Yeah, the Nazis, as it turned out, also had kind of a mania for stealing shiny shit, partially because they had no money and they needed to fund their, like, ultimately doomed war effort, and partly because they were creepy little weirdos who liked stealing stuff. Why didn't they have money? So we're going to start at the end. Okay. So the date was April 6th, 1945, and Anglo-American forces were driving east through Germany. (laughs) I am not looking ahead two weeks to what Hitler's doing. (laughs) I am not. Um, We we, we are putting that out of our minds. (laughs) Yeah, because that does not come into this story. Although, uh, Rip Bozo. I just, if anyone says April 1945, my first thought is just Hitler killing himself. As it should be. Happy birthday, bud. Anyway. We do not wish Hitler a happy birthday on this podcast. The official Daughters of Ferric stance on the birthday of, Ad- Hitler of Adolf Hitler. Hitler is not Hitler. a birthday boy. Hitler is not. I would hit Adolf Hitler, even if it was his birthday. I would kill baby Hitler. (laughs) What if someone asked you that question and you were like, fucking did, bro. Time travel. In a small town called Merkers, which had recently been liberated, two American military policemen, all cops are not bad, I guess. No, fuck them. They're pigs. I don't care what they do in this story. I don't even know where this is going, but they're pigs anyway. So two American military policemen happened to pick up a pair of pregnant women who told them about some suspicious activities that occurred in a mine nearby the previous week. Merkers was known for its salt mines, which are uniquely long and shallow, making them an ideal hiding place for stuff. After gathering more information from local authorities and a British POW who had helped unload the treasure reportedly stored in the mines, a number of American soldiers descended into the mine on April 7th. What they found was astonishing. Over 50 literal sacks of cash containing 1 million Reichmarks each (laughs) and a sealed vault door, which the mine owners said contained a large quantity of gold. Do you know how much the Reichmark was worth at that point? Because that was the end of the war. Four Reichmarks to a dollar. Okay, thank you. So this is like Cash. $15 million in 1940s money. In the salt mine. A lot of money. So the next day, Americans doing American things went down and blew a hole in the vault's wall and uncovered a National Treasure-esque hall of loot, a 150 <laughs> by 75 foot underground cavern that was about 25 feet tall. So this is like actually That's national huge. treasure. That is big. Containing nearly nine billion billion dollars worth of gold (laughs) hell yeah man some stacked in neat piles of bars like a cheesy action movie (laughs) as well as over 150 priceless works of art taken out from all over europe nicholas cage opens the vault doors and he's like adolf hitler's lost treasure (laughs) finally uncovered and like also along with like these stacks of gold and these like 150 artworks including i believe a da vinci there were suitcases just full of jewelry oh yeah yeah not so funny yeah i can yeah so i see where this is going (laughs) so yeah gold played an unexpectedly large role in the events of and surrounding the second world war republican spain that's the good guys in the spanish civil war uh used it to buy weapons from the soviet union key players in the roosevelt administration wanted to use it to help temper the effects of the great depression and the nazis went on a veritable spree of gold theft throughout the continent as it turns out we still haven't quite evolved beyond an affinity for shiny metals i haven't i love shiny I love metal. shiny metals. Yeah. In a way, gold was the second oil of World War II. The Nazis had to keep conquering to acquire
acquire stores of both in order to continue financing and prosecuting the war. Germany was a fiat currency. Had a fiat currency, no. right? No, it was. It Germany was gold back. Was always gold backed okay. currency until after the war. Got it. Which made them kind of like an outlier among the international players because by that time most people had ditched the gold standard. Sure. The William Jennings Bryan would be like triggered right now. <laughs> yeah, our favorite listen- listener of the podcast, friend of the pod, uh, William, William Jennings, Jennings Bryan. Bryan. Yeah. German William Jennings Bryan would be like, it shall not in crucify in Deutschland upon a cross in of gold. Anyway, Germany's obsession with gold began in the bad days immediately following the First World War. Hyperinflation was rampant, with the Weimar Republic eventually beginning to place notes as high as 100 trillion marks into regular circulation. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's too many. Actually, it's none. But so, like quantity-wise, that's too many, you know? Mm-hmm. You could buy like a loaf of bread with that as well. That's what that was worth. An American-trained economist named Yalmar Horace Greeley Shat. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Everyone listening, be sure to go Google Shat hyperinflation <laughs> just to check this for yourself. <laughs> Jesus so Christ. after he succeeded by creating a whole new currency um, <laughs> and to get rid of the old one, he was put in charge of the Reichsbank, which is Germany's equivalent of the Federal Reserve, and began a pseudo mercantilist program of revaluing Germany's currency with the gold standard. Okay, got it. Mercantilism, for those who are not aware, is an outmoded economic system which places a huge amount of importance on the balance of trade. The idea is that countries that accumulate a lot of gold via exporting things to other countries are economically powerful, while those that are forced to spend their gold to import commodities are weaker. It was very popular in the era before the American Revolution and is one of the other reasons that Parliament was taxing the American colonies. So why is it outmoded? Did it not work or did it get superseded by something else? As it turns out, to grow in an industrial age, you need capital investment, both from in your own country and in foreign countries. Cry. Holding on to your gold like a little baby, it does not facilitate that very well. Modern economists are generally not in favor of mercantilism, except for Donald Trump. Is he? Kind of. Modern economists? economist Donald J. I would call him an economist. Trump. He has an economy degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Does he? Uh-huh. That's wild. So, is it real? Did he actually go to the University yeah, of Pennsylvania? Yeah, he went to the University wow. of Pennsylvania. Damn. Not because he was smart, which is sure. the reason most people go to the University of Pennsylvania, but because he was rich. Sure. So most other countries, as we have already discussed, were already making the switch over to fiat currency, but Shat was determined to hold on to... <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Should Keep I going. call him Greeley instead? Because uh, that's also his last name. I think that's a really good idea. We're going to call him Greeley from now on. So Greeley was was determined to hold on to the gold standard, and as previously noted, William Jennings Bryan is seething. So following the Nazis' rise to power, Greeley remained in control of the Reichsbank, but control over foreign currencies was handed over to Nazi henchman and leader of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring. Bad guy. Certified bad guy. <laughs> also really bad at running an air force, it turns out. Those two things may go together, actually. Here's the thing about fascism is it doesn't, it's, it does, doesn't really sustain itself. Interesting. I would never have guessed from the many successful fascist regimes in the world today. Fascism can get you power for like 10 years. About 10 or, years. Or if you're Franco, like 30. He's a fucking outlier, you know? Empire also something of an outlier, not quite so far, but 20 years is pretty Empire? good. Empire? We're a Star Wars podcast. <gasps> oh, yeah, the Empire. Yeah, Palpatine did do pretty well. Yeah, he, he didn't do good, but like considering how checked out he was as a ruler, <laughs> did pretty well. Maybe that's why they continued fine. It's because he built this I mean, machine like kind of off of the bones of the Republic and was like, just fucking keep working. I don't care. I think that World War II probably would have gone on for a year longer if Hitler wasn't such an idiot. So this is true. Only a year? I would, I no, would think, I think it longer. I think you have to remember by 1945 how overwhelming the industrial superiority of the Allies was. By the end of 42, the Allies were already producing three or four times as much as the Axis. And so by 45, they're like rolling out a Boeing plane from like Seattle like every hour. Jesus. And so it was it was over. Okay. But it would have lasted a little longer if they hadn't made some stupid decisions in places like Stalingrad. Anywho, Goering proceeded to do the thing that the Nazis loved to accuse the Jews of doing and established a semi-secret group of bankers that would pursue means to increase Germany's supply of reserve gold in <laughs> Pursuit of autarky, which is mercantilism in German, basically. Oh, okay. Self-sufficiency. I, I think I do want to say, actually, on that point, there will come a point where we talk about the Mandalorian people partially through the lens of Judaism. <laughs> and I think it, it would be really problematic not to acknowledge the fact that me saying that Beskar is important to the Mandalorians and making a comparison oh, between... That. Yes, I've had this on my mind for like a mm, week or two. Um, bad Ellie. Making a comparison 
comparison between Imperial Beskar and Nazi gold and the Mandalorians and Jews could lead you to some both anti-Semitic and weirdly incorrect places. So just getting that out of the way. Also, we're three for three on talking about anti-Semitism on this podcast. As it turns in out, the last, big problem. In the last couple of weeks. The most like historically enduring form of prejudice is anti-Semitism. Sure is. So, early so. acquisitions of gold by the Nazis. Number one, Austria. Another good reason for the Angeles in 1938, the Austrian Central Bank had nearly 100 tons of gold on hand. Whoa. That's a lot of gold, especially for a small country like Austria. How big is Austria? Say when. About that big. Got it. That's not a lot of space to keep 100, 100... tons of gold yeah. in. Austria is like the size of New England. Not big. A lot of so, gold. A lot, a lot gold of gold in Austria. Uh, and rearmament was not coming cheap for the Reich. And Hitler needed more funds to keep his new war machine spinning. In total, 91 tons of Austrian Central Bank gold was sent back to Germany to feed the Nazi war machine. Czechoslovakia... Where, where'd the rest of it go? <laughs> so they kept like 8 tons in Austria to make sure that like the Austrian mark did not collapse. They don't need that... Okay, fine. Czechoslovakia. The Nazi regime also subsumed them in 1938 and 1939, stealing about 45 tons of gold from their central bank. So if we're keeping track, we're at like... 145 tons. No, we're at like 138 tons. Sure. This was an especially crushing blow for the Czechoslovak people, since most of that gold had been donated by private citizens. Just like... Why? Czechoslovakia was a brand new nation at the time, and to provide backing for their national currency, the country's first central bank minister had asked the citizenry to donate their family jewelry and bullion to the central bank. That makes sense. They were like, oh my gosh, we get to have a country? We need to have money for our new country. And so everyone in the country donated like their wedding rings and their gold watches to the country who melted it down into like gold bars and provided a backing for their currency. What a nation state does to a motherfucker. I know. Nationalism be like. This is like wholesome nationalism, honestly. No such thing, Sophie. Untrue. The Czechoslovak people donating their money to create Czechoslovak currency. Very wholesome. So yeah, it was very sad because all these people had given like grandma's wedding ring to the country so that they could have like a stable currency. And, and now daddy's Adolf. And Daddy now, Adolf got it. And now Adolf is using it to buy Panzer threes. Yeah. You know, if I had that much gold, I would buy Panzer threes. I would not. As general war loomed on the horizon, other small European countries began sending their gold to larger nations for safekeeping. Thousands of tons were sent across the ocean to be stored at the U.S.'s famous Fort Knox, with about another thousand sent to the United Kingdom. Woof. I think 10,000 tons in total were sent to Fort Knox during the war. I feel like there's not a lot to be gained by my commentary in this episode largely being, wow, that's a lot of gold, but wow, that's a lot of gold. (laughs) Yes, it is. A lot of gold. Even the Vatican sent nearly eight tons of gold to the United States, despite our long mistrust of, quote, popery, unquote. Popery! Being Catholic was actually a crime in some U.S. colonies, mostly Massachusetts, until 1780. It used to be a crime to be Catholic in the U.S., and now the Vatican is sending gold to us. The U.K. would continue sending its gold to the United States even through the darkest days of the Battle of the Atlantic, with the idea being that the royal family and government could escape to Canada and start an absentee government in the case of invasion. What the hell? Gotta have lots of gold to do monarchy. What monarchy does to a motherfucker. (laughs) That was legit their plan. Like, they were sending all their bullion to the United States so that in the case that the mainland United Kingdom got invaded. Why send it to the United States? Why not send it to Canada? Because Canada did not have a secure place to store as much gold as the United Kingdom had. Damn, like, showing United up Kingdom, by not being weird Well, you have boobers. to remember that before 1945, the pound sterling was the world's reserve currency. So the United Kingdom, since they were still sort of-ish on the gold standard, had to have a lot of gold to back all that up. And they had a lot of gold. Why are you saying that they were sort of-ish on the gold standard? Because they were sort of-ish on the gold standard. Cool answer. I, it's too complicated for this episode, and I don't understand it myself. Cool. Uh, some nations, like Luxembourg and Belgium, entrusted their gold to France, which would prove to be a less optimal solution. Wait, wait, wait. So everyone is just kind of sending their gold places... To keep it to from keep the Germans. To keep it from the Nazis. Because they all had seen what had happened to Czechoslovakia and to... Austria. Austria and Poland as well later. We would like to be able to have our gold once the war is over, if we lose. So let's not keep it here. We're going to learn some wild stories about what happened in France here in a minute. They were literally shuffling like trains full of gold out in front of the Nazis to get it to the ports and ship it to Canada and the US. 
as the second stage of the Blitzkrieg rolled across Europe, a surprising amount of energy was expended on keeping gold out of Nazis' hands. Poland had fallen, but not before sending a goodly portion of its gold to France, but the Nazis did get 50 tons of Polish gold. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of gold. <laughs> no. Denmark and Norway were the next to go, but they managed to get their gold to Britain and then to the United States and Canada. So, like, but I the... thought there wasn't anywhere to hold it in Canada. Not very much was sent to Canada. Most of it was sent to Fort Knox. Okay. The Netherlands were not so lucky. Nearly 200 tons of Dutch gold were left to Nazi hands after they capitulated, with an additional 150 tons having been sent to the United Kingdom. For the record, I've, I've like, 100% lost track of how much gold is we'll, in play here. We will get, I think it's something like the Nazis steal, like, 1,000 tons worth of gold from countries in the war. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> the Belgians and the Luxembourgese had, as previously discussed, sent their gold to France along with Poland, and as the invasion closed in, the French government engaged in a mad scramble to get gold out of its country. Some was sent to France's African and Middle Eastern colonies, and more was shipped to the United States and Britain. Still, the Nazis ended up with a goodly sum, especially in Belgian leftovers, about $200 million worth of gold. Stealing gold from the various small nations in Europe became something of a pastime for the Nazis. <laughs> It's my hobby, you know. My cousin, she makes quilts. My mom, she bakes bread. I steal gold from Central European countries. Just girly things. <laughs> Towards the end of the war in 43 and 44, when things were getting desperate, the Nazi regime even stole gold from their erstwhile allies, the Italians. Damn. Even from like the Italians. Like 150 tons, too. <laughs> Why? And also, how? Weren't they friends? Why didn't they not do that? Weren't the Italians pissed? They used, well, they were kind of out of the equation at that point. Wait. Wait, when was this? 43 and 44. So this is oh. after the U.S. and friends have invaded. Yeah, okay, never mind. And they switched sides. Which they did in both world wars, by the way, interestingly enough. Can't stand a flake. So, total thievery in dollar amounts. $598 million, which amounts to about $10.5 billion in 2023. Whoa, that's a lot of gold. Are you happy that's a lot of reacting gold. to that's a lot of gold? And it may have been more. Why? How? What? Because we're not entirely sure. <laughs> I thought that was all of the gold in the world. We're not entirely sure what happened to all the gold, and nobody is exactly sure how much the Soviet Union captured, which really messes with these calculations. There are estimates of up to $30 billion of Nazi gold having existed at one point or another. That's a lot of tons. When and where did the Soviets take some? So uh, there was apparently a bunch of Nazi gold hidey hold in like Poland and East Germany, and they found it. And that big find that we found earlier, that $9 billion gold find that we thought was most of the Nazi gold that was left over after the war, after the Soviets found something in East Germany, they dropped all claim to it, meaning that they probably found something better and more. Oh, what? <laughs> so so that's, why, that's why we have no idea is because it's just kind of, well, I assume that the Soviet Union got something better but we but have no we idea what. But we don't know how much. What if it was like they got, you know, alien technology and so they gave up the gold? Well, and or it was some bullshit like that. You know, like, Soviet... like Indiana Jones ass shit where the Nazis, like their occult stuff was actually related to they something. They found the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, <laughs> precisely. That's literally what I'm talking about. Um, funnily enough, the Soviet regime also had kind of an obsession with gold. By the time the war started, the Soviets had accrued about 3,000 tons worth of gold. And when the war started, they shipped it over the Urals along with all of their most valuable items, including Lenin's corpse. Okay, I think there is, there's something about gold that fundamentally appeals. It's fundamentally appeals, authoritarian. Yeah, it appeals to the like magpie dude bro brain, you know, the little I want all of the cool guy shiny things. I think it's like just kind of part of it. I, th I think the character of the authoritarian is such that he likes gold. Yeah, the character of weird little ruler guys is that they like a little shiny snack. <laughs> So, now we get to go to the not depressing part, the Holocaust. What? No. No. That is actually the very bad That's part. That's the bad part. So As it's opposed to the rest of this, which was fine. Yeah. It's also important to mention the role that the Nazi desire for valuables played in the Holocaust. Victims at the various death camps in Poland and Germany were stripped of their valuables, which were either melted down to pay for the Nazi war effort or held in reserve. Some of the gold found in that Merkur salt mine was taken from Holocaust victims. Cool. Reportedly as many as 70 suitcases full of jewelry. In total, somewhere around four tons of gold was taken from victims of the Holocaust, valued at the time somewhere between five and ten million dollars. Oh my god. So four tons of um, melted wedding rings. That's a lot of rings. Which shows you how terrible the scale of the Holocaust was, really. I can imagine the, like, Holocaust museum exhibit where it's just, like, all the little rings put up on the wall. You walk into a room and it's a hallway and it's, like, a million billion rings. And you're like, oh no, fascism is bad after all. Holocaust yeah. museums are great, but that is kind of the point. Well, they're not that great. Not the they're point. horrible. It's cool that they exist. This is true. Okay, and so if you were to pick a German institution that you would feel like 
like is not super involved in murdering large amounts of people, you might think like the Federal Reserve and you would be wrong (laughs) because they were charged with processing all of the gold stolen from Holocaust victims Hmm. and melting it down into standardized bars. Hmm. Reportedly, there were several conscientious objectors who were shot over this. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, they were correct. Including our boy Greeley. Damn it. He was deposed and sent to a concentration (sighs) camp. Fucking hell, man. Because he didn't want to do Nazi shit. I do quite like to hear that. You don't get a lot of those people in these sorts of stories. It was because he was part of this, like, socialist Catholic church as well. Oh my god, hell yeah, man. He's a weirdo. There is something to be said for the way in which authoritarian bureaucracy has to operate, your deeply bureaucratic processes also have to be doing genocide, right? Like, it is not something that can just be done by your armed forces. It has to be the machine of the state. Okay, Lenin. Um, (laughs) That was a very Leninist phrase there. Yeah, Eleanor Ulyanov. That's a sick ass name. Oh, and we're early enough. You're gonna change your last name. Yeah, again. Or I guess I didn't change it ever. Um. So basically, proving that there are no elements of the German government during World War II that had clean hands. There is no clean Wehrmacht. There is no clean Federal Reserve. <laughs> also, Nazi gold gets us into the wonderful territory of neutral complicity because while there were supposedly neutral nations in Europe during World War II, in fact, there were not. Oh no. Yeah, Swiss citizen. <laughs> Swiss citizen Eleanor, as it turns out, is complicit in the Holocaust. I I will say I am well aware that Switzerland, uh, yeah. So as a as a country in Europe in the World War II period, you had three choices. Number one, directly side with the Allies and get brutally crushed and oppressed for about six years. Number two, directly side with the Germans and get brutally crushed, but later and for a better reason. Number three, toady up to the Nazis and pretend to be neutral without officially joining the dark side. The three genders. Tag yourself, tag yourself, I'm toady I'm getting, up to the Nazis. Tag yourself, I'm getting brutally crushed by the Germans in 1939. Uh, call me... Call me Poland the way I'm uh, I'm getting brutally crushed by Nazis. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Switzerland, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden all sold war material to the Nazi regime and its allies, often bought using gold stolen from various European countries and literal Holocaust victims. Fuck them. Like, you have to remember, like, no one wants the Reichsmark because it's not a useful currency outside of Germany. But they want gold. But they want gold because they all still have this weird little, like, corner of their brain that's mercantilist. And sure. wants, like, the balance of trade of our gold is so important. And so they would accept gold for, like, tungsten and iron and coal and heavy water. The Swiss were especially bad since they provided the <laughs> banking mechanisms by which the Nazis were able to purchase foreign goods despite the British blockade and nearly global embargo on trade with Germany. How do you think that that gold got to Portugal when Germany did not share a border with Portugal? You send the gold to Switzerland and then that gold from Switzerland goes to Portugal to buy the tungsten which is then sent to like Spain and then trucked over the border into occupied France where the Germans can get at it. I disavow my Swiss relatives. I disavow my Swiss heritage. No, it's whatever. (laughs) Too long didn't read. All the neutral countries in Europe were complicit with Nazi war crimes in the Holocaust even though some of them did some quite heroic things like Danish citizens spirited most of Denmark's Jewish population to Sweden where they remained in relative safety for the duration. I mean, that's preferable. What most countries did when faced with Jewish refugees in the early days of World War II was just say, no, go back to Germany. Shout out to the United States of America. For turning away like 7,000 Jews, listening. the Brits, turning away the French even. Drop a five-star rating if you're American. That's most of you. Rate and like this podcast. Share it with your mom. She'd like it. No, she wouldn't. Um, so in conclusion, the Nazis were creepy little genocidal kleptomaniacs with a special love for gold. And seriously, this does not even cover all the valuable other stuff, like art and architecture, that the Nazis snatched from vanquished countries. Like, they raided the Louvre. Wait, they took valuable architecture? Uh Uh-huh. How? You take the building apart and put it back together in a different place. I guess they fucked up the Parthenon. They were planning to do it with the Arc de Triomphe if they won the war. If... To, not to like be like, oh, the Nazis were kind of funny, but like the reason the Arc de Triomphe was erected was a French victory over the Germans. Oh, that would... Okay. And so they wanted to take it back to Germany and be like, ah, sucks, bitch. Do you think if they had done that, that France would get it back later? Or do you think they just kind of awkwardly leave it? Historically, France is the one country in Europe that always eventually wins. So they would have got it back later. Okay. Like France, except World War II, is probably the most militarily successful nation in history. They're the Obi-Wan Kenobi of countries. They just don't lose. That's my boy. 
So Nazis bad, stole a lot of gold. It's kind of bizarre. I would really like to have been there when they opened the National Treasure Vault in like the little village in Germany, because that would have been quite funny. You, Nicholas Cage right there, opening up Adolf Hitler's lost treasure, and you're behind, you're like the little computer guy. They couldn't get back the actor for, what's his name, Riley. <laughs> He's the best goddamn part of those movies. I've I mean, seen I National would just treasure. like to see that much gold in person. I just want to know what that looks like. The most gold I have seen is like my mom's wedding ring. <laughs> do you think it'd be like cool or do you think it's kind of boring? I feel like it's kind of boring. I think it would be like weird, right? Like trippy. Like when you walk into like one of those really big grocery stores and there's like 50 like a, different apple juices and you're like, that just doesn't seem right. It would be like a Gorbachev moment, right? Like you walk into the thing and you're like, this has been a certified Gorbachev moment. <laughs> Subscribe to the podcast for more, more certified Gorbachev, Gorbachev moments. moments. <laughs> Okay, well, we're done here. We've talked about enough Nazi shit for one lifetime. If you want to listen to new episodes as they release, you can find us on most places you can listen to podcasts. On our website, daughtersofferrix.com, or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, at ferrixpod, F-E-R-R-I-X-P-O-D. New episodes release every other Wednesday. Listen to them. I'm begging you to listen to them. I beg you every episode to listen to them. Come back in two weeks. I will be here. Sophie will be here. Probably no one else. Develop a parasocial relationship with us. We're your best friends. Please listen. If you have any questions, suggestions, or corrections, you can send them to our show email daughtersferrix at gmail.com. I have been Eleanor Mueller. You can find me at The Letter Bomber on most platforms. And Sophie, where can our lovely listeners find you? You can't find me on Twitter anymore because it's gone down the drain, but you can find me at the red line underscore pod, a podcast about public transportation and cities. That's it, really. Our episodes are written by me, Sophia Dunstan, and Eleanor Muir. Damn, second billing. Our podcast art is by Jill Muir. Our intro and outro music was arranged by Eleanor with themes from Nicholas Bertel and John Williams. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to George M. Tabor, who wrote Chasing Gold, which was the primary source for this episode. Special thanks to Tabor Van Dorn. I'm really excited for the new episodes of Young Jedi Adventures coming out tomorrow as of recording this. Special thanks to our boy, Hjalmar Horace Greeley Shat. Our best friend.